Well, Craig, I understand all the modes and channeling, but how do you hook it all together? Well, there's a bunch of, of different ways of approaching that. It sort of depends upon the complexity of your system. Uh, of course, the, uh, we, we already mentioned that a lot of units have MIDI in, out, and through. Right. Like the, uh, the MMT8 sequencer has all three connectors, whereas the SR16 has a MIDI in and a switchable MIDI out or through. Right. And so you have to actually tell the unit whether you want it to be an out or a, or a through, how that output jack functions. Okay. So just be clear about that, because in some cases you'll want to use a through, and in other cases you'll want to use an out. So you do have to specify that. Okay. Well, let's look at the first diagram here. This shows a real simple, basic MIDI setup. Uh, the, the left block here is a keyboard or MIDI guitar or MIDI drum pads or some kind of MIDI controller. It sends its data out the MIDI out. And then the second unit here is a, like a signal processor or a, a sound module, you know, some kind of sound generator, a mixer, a lighting controller, anything that can be controlled by MIDI. And we just route the MIDI out into the MIDI in, the simple transmitter receiver type relationship. Okay. Okay, so that's the simplest setup you can do. Now in diagram two here, we have a keyboard, a multi-tamoral keyboard, feeding a sequencer. And you'll notice here that we have the MIDI out from the keyboard going to the MIDI in of the sequencer, and the MIDI out of the sequencer going back to the MIDI in of the keyboard. Okay. That way, when you play a part on the keyboard, you can record it into the sequencer, and then on playback, you can play that sound from the keyboard. Now remember, this is a multi-tamoral keyboard with several virtual instruments, each on its own channel. So I can record, say, a bass part on channel one, record that into the sequencer, play it back into channel one of the keyboard and get a bass sound. Then switch the keyboard over to channel two and play a guitar part, record that into the sequencer. Now the sequencer will send out information on channel one and two back into the keyboard. And you can uh, listen to the sounds coming out of the sequencer while you're writing the new parts. Well, remember the the, keyboard. there aren't any sounds coming out of the sequencer. Right. It's only okay. data. The, the, okay, the so the data's coming out of the sequencer. You can hear the sounds coming out of the keyboard, though. Right. Okay. If That's it's multi-timbral, which is the reason why multi-timbral stuff is real nice to have. Right. Now, there's, there's one, um, there are some complications that this we'll get into later, which is some sequencers have a built-in MIDI through function. So we'll actually send the incoming data right back out to the keyboard and set up a feedback loop, where it's getting the input that you're playing on the keyboard Plus, it's getting that stuff echoed back from the sequencer, so you're actually hitting the keyboard with twice as many notes as you'd want to. There's a way around that, and we'll, we'll get into that later. That's something you don't want to occur. Right, exactly. Okay. So uh, that, that it brings up the concept of local control, which, uh, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But I do want you to be aware that in a lot of situations, just hooking a MIDI out to a MIDI into a sequencer and a sequencer MIDI out to a MIDI in back to the keyboard, you might experience some problems. Okay. Now, diagram three here, this is an example of how to use MIDI through. This is a, a process called daisy chaining because you're just chaining the, uh, the through from one unit into the in of another. On the left here, we have a keyboard, and let's suppose it has a built-in sequencer, you know, with start-stop type commands. Uh -huh. uh, it sends its MIDI out signals to the MIDI in of an expander module so that we can uh, layer sounds, for example, maybe have brass and strings going at the same time or something like that. An expander module is? Uh, so another sound generator, like okay. a rack mount uh, module without the keyboard. Okay. And this is good for layering. Now, if we just took those two things, we have our basic MIDI setup, an out going to an in. Right. But now remember that the through carries a duplicate signal of what appears at the MIDI in. Okay. So what that means is that essentially what we're doing is we're taking the MIDI out from the keyboard, and we're not only feeding it to this expander module, but we're also feeding that same signal into the quad reverb. Untouched by the expander module. Exactly, exactly. Well, there is a, it is going through a little circuitry in there, but it's, it's nothing crucial or that modifies the signal or anything like that. It's just, it just uh, sends a signal through. Um, you, you might think, now, why can't you just use a standard Y chord, like with an audio signal, and just you know, split the thing into yeah. two separate outputs? But MIDI doesn't work that way, and digital data doesn't work that way. Audio works that way. <laughs> okay. The, um, but you really can't do that because there's a, a MIDI output expects to see a certain type of circuit as a MIDI in. And if it sees two of them, it will get very confused. So that's why the MIDI through exists. Now you'll also notice that we've taken the quadroverb, we've set the MIDI out to MIDI through, so that it also carries 
that initial signal from the keyboard, and that's driving the MIDI in of the SR16. The reason why we're doing that is, remember I said that the keyboard has a sequencer on it? Right. Well, if we don't, necess we don't have to record something to that sequencer, but what we can do is use the keyboard's play, stop, continue controls to control the SR16. So here in this one setup, we have a keyboard that's layering sounds, that's being going through a signal processor, and that can also start and stop the SR16, all from a master keyboard. And remember how we were talking earlier about um, being able to start, stop, and do program changes and all that sort of stuff remotely? Right. So what this also means is from that one keyboard, we can send out program changes that change the sound on the expander module and change the uh, different programs in the quadroverb. So this is a, uh, this is a type of, of system you might use if you were like, performing as a solo act with your drum machine your signal processor, your sounds, and all that. Okay. Now, there is one complication with a MIDI through. Now, you mentioned it's untouched by you know, circuitry. Right. But the fact is that there is one stage of circuitry that it has to go through to generate a MIDI through. And if you go through too many MIDI through stages, basically what it does is it starts to distort the data a little bit. It's like, a, it's like a, how a real long guitar chord can load down the guitar sound. It's the same kind of principle here. Signal. Yeah, it's, it, it interferes with the integrity of the data. Okay. Okay. So if you're going to be, ha if you have to s feed a lot of different synthesizers, like let's suppose, well, let's look at diagram four here. Here we have a sequencer being fed by a master keyboard, but we want to use that sequencer to drive a whole bunch of other synthesizers and signal processors, probably all set to poly mode. Okay. Like we'll have a bass on, on track one, a piano on track two, horns on, on track three, strings on track four. And uh, let's assume that not a lot of these synths are multi-timbral, so we need to use several different synthesizers. Or maybe we have some older synthesizers that aren't multi-timbral, plus we have some signal processors we need to feed and all that. What we can do is insert what's called a MIDI through box. And what this does is it takes the MIDI signal and buffers it, strengthens it, and sends it all to a bunch of individual outputs. In this, in this diagram here, we're showing a through box with five outputs but it's not uncommon to see a through box with eight outputs or 16 outputs. Okay, now are these different MIDI channels? Uh, it doesn't, it's what, it, remember the channel assignment is part of the data. Okay. So whatever you tell it, I mean, the, the same signal is hitting all these different synthesizers and signal processors, but if the first synthesizer is tuned to channel one, it will ignore all the other channels. It's okay. just like a television. You have your antenna picking up all these different signals, but what you do is you set the tuning selector on the TV to just pick up one channel, right. and it ignores all the other stuff. The same thing is happening here. Each one of the lines coming out of the MIDI through box is carrying all the MIDI data at all times, but you're just picking off the channels that are of interest to the particular processor or synthesizer. Okay. Okay. Now, I told you about the local control thing. Here we have diagram five that shows how local control works. Local control is a feature that's found inside a keyboard that also has sound generators. Okay. Uh, well, like the EPS here right. has built-in sound generators plus a keyboard. It's not just a master keyboard that only generates data. It uses that data to control its sound generators, too. What local control does, with local control on, there's a path from, the, you can think of it conceptually as a path from the MIDI out to the MIDI in, that there's a bridge between those two, and so the keyboard can drive the sound generators as well as send signals out the MIDI out connection. Okay. That's local on. With local off, that connection is broken. And what happens is the keyboard sends out the MIDI out, but the sound generators will only play what's coming in through the MIDI in. Okay. So if you step up to a keyboard, you turn it on, you start playing, and nothing happens, you might want to check whether local control is on or off. If you step up to it and you have nothing else hooked up to it. Right. I mean, if it's just sitting there by itself, you right. play it. Now, now, a lot of keyboards, when you turn them on, automatically turn local control to on, just Makes to sense. make sure <laughs> that people don't get horribly confused. But it still can happen. Uh, no, not all keyboards are designed the same way. And if local control is off, you can pound those keys all day and nothing's going to happen unless you hook the MIDI out to the MIDI in right. and provides you know, an external path. Now, the reason why this is useful with a sequencer is, let's suppose uh, you're sending something out on channel one into the sequencer, and it's coming back uh, into channel one on a multi-timbral instrument. 
if you have local control on, it's getting the signal from the keyboard and it's getting the signal that's being fed through the sequencer. So it's getting twice as many notes and twice as much data and can even set up a MIDI feedback loop where the unit locks up. That's, yeah, that doesn't by, sound too good. Right. So by breaking that connection and turning local control off, then the keyboard feeds the sequencer. Right. The sequencer will have its own software through connection, which will route the data back into your keyboard. Okay, so it only gets one set of data. Right, only one set of data. The other thing about these uh, sequencer software through is that it's usually adjustable for different channels. So, for example, if you're playing, if the sequencer is playing back three tracks you've already re already recorded on channels one, two, and three, mm -hmm. and now you want to do something on channel four, you can send it in from the keyboard, and it doesn't matter what channel it's on, the sequencer will convert it to channel four data and throw it back into the sound generators. Without you specifying what channel you want? At the keyboard. At you the keyboard. do it right at the sequencer. Right. And yeah. the reason for doing this is so that if you're in a, in a fit of creative passion, you don't have to go back to the keyboard and keep readjusting the output right. channel. But again, that's, that's something that's a little more sequencer oriented, but I mention it now because one of these days you'll run into it and you'll remember and go, oh yeah, software through and the whole local control thing will come back and all that. Right. So that's really, local control is really used as a way to manage sequencing type environments. If you're not using a sequencer, you'll probably never encounter this. Okay. Um, so that's basically, now diagram six summarizes this. We have a keyboard we have the sequencer, and you'll see the MIDI out from the keyboard is going into the MIDI end of the sequencer. The MIDI out from the sequencer is going into the MIDI end of the keyboard, and the MIDI through function is handled at the sequencer itself to route the data back in, and we have local control off on the keyboard. Would it be a strange application to uh, keep the local on enabled, send out MIDI data on channel one through local on to the internal sound generator, but also send something else out channel two? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I, well, you see, that that's one of the nice things about MIDI. Not only are there several ways to accomplish the same task, but there are several tasks that you might not think of normally but can be done through MIDI. For example, that's a real easy way to check out what a sound would be like if it was doubled. Turn local control on, you know, play the what, whatever instruments on channel one. Meantime, route the information through the sequencer and uh, s use the software through on the sequencer to feed channel two. So now you're playing the sound generators in one and two from one keyboard. Right. Okay. So that would, be, that would be cool if you wanted to find out what, what uh, you know, for example, a, a harp transient and a guitar sound would sound like layered together, which is actually pretty cool. That would be a good way to find out. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of, of, of different ways you can mess around with this stuff, and uh, some of them you'll discover unintentionally. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> but, but like you said, that's a good example right there. So that's really all there is to MIDI hookups. It's, uh, the main thing to remember is the outs go to the ins. <laughs> it's just like audio. Right. Uh, that the through connection carries a replica of what's at the MIDI in. You don't want to daisy chain too many MIDI throughs together, maybe four or five maximum. Once you get past that, you really need a through box. Okay. And then remember too, if you're doing sequencers, uh, sequencer applications, to study how the sequencer handles the through, the through function and whether you need to turn local control on the keyboard on or off. And you should be okay. Is there a length restriction on one MIDI cable? Or? Yeah, there is. The, the MIDI specification states that you shouldn't really use cables that are over 50 feet long. Okay. Uh, in point of fact, uh, there are some, there are like special quality cables with very low capacitance where you can drive up to 100 feet no problem. And people have even used like twin lead, uh, 300 ohm line like you use on TV antennas uh -huh. and transmitted hundreds and hundreds of feet. And there are line drivers that will allow you to transmit even further and there's a, a, a new development called a, a MIDI tap which is a special kind of driver that allows you to transmit the thing thousands of feet if you want. And of course you could use fiber optic cables if you wanted to transmit a couple miles or whatever. And that had lots of money, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, 50 feet is, is the recommended maximum for, for standard grade wire. Okay. You'll find in, in the average studio though that you, you don't have to worry too much about MIDI runs. If you have a, a you know, 10 foot cable or a 15 foot cable, it's not, you're not gonna have problems with the sound, with, you know, with the data being degraded or anything like that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Sounds, it's very simple. Yeah, it all is. The, the difficult part is uh, making sure that you set the channels right, that the, right. you know, the, yeah, those, are, those the are the things you have to, that's why people write manuals. Right. Because all that information is in there, hopefully.